of the things to think about is Indian film industry is now 100 plus years old. The first film, first feature film, was released in 1913. So, and it's been a commercial film industry since then. And the moment talkies were introduced, um, the film industry split into multiple languages. So India makes films in about 20 different languages and dialects. Um, most of it is commercial. Some of it is backed by the state and therefore has, you know, there's, there's not that same imperative, but bulk of the films are um, commercially made. Now, this is an industry that is born during the empire. It's also born in a, in a situation where very, very small percentage, I think it's 6%, are literate at that point. Um, so how do, you, how do you reach out with narratives? How do you reach out with, um, in the start of the 20th century, with political message and political um, ideas? Well, you use films. Um, now, I'm not saying that every filmmaker was politically engaged or, or informed, but there was a core group um, who made some of the big iconic movies, um, big successes, who were very clear as to where they stood. Um, and as the industry develops, more writers um, get involved. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a very strong call right through the, the 20s on to about the 70s of really politically engaged, um, explicitly um, ideologically driven writers who are involved with writing um, scripts, dialogue, um, lyrics for songs. And so I think the, the starting point of the industry is in some ways um, in this imperial era, but it's also anti-colonial because they're addressing a different audience. They're not addressing the empire um, managers or empire uh, upholders. They're addressing the opposite side. Falke's um, Raja Harishchand, which is a 1913 film, um, very, very first feature film in India. And it's made very clear, it's inspired by um, the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, because that's the big film that comes out, he watches it, he's a photographer, he's a still photographer, he's got a studio of his own. And he looks at it and he says, you know, I, we want to have our stories up there. That's his starting point. And I love that kind of creative impulse that goes, okay, this is what we're getting. How do we change this? Well, we, we, I make my own mo movie. So there's a whole, whole kind of mythical story about, you know, how he mortgages everything and pawns all his wife's jewelry and so on and so forth. There's this whole kind of, all the wonderful what are now Bollywood tropes about the heroic struggle and he makes the films. Uh, he puts it all together. And it comes out and becomes this huge success. And it is the story of a very popularly known character um, from antiquity, mythology, however you want to place it, of the just ruler. And um, even though it isn't explicit at that point, but there is very clearly a critique built in of, you know, this is the just ruler who is Indian versus, let's say, the, the ruler who's neither. So I think that's the starting point of it. And I think that continues. And um, we were talking about um, in, in, in the session about even the contemporary films. Um, they're, they're, there's very much um, a sense of political critique. There's a very clear sense of um, anti-colonial uh, critique um, that's built in. Uh, having said that, there is of course also political agendas and um, funding that goes into, let's say, films that are not going to be um, things that you and I may agree with. So there is a lot of, um, there's a recent trend towards explicitly, for example, Islamophobic films. Um, and that is, that is a worry. Um, but it fits certain genders anyway. But then the flip side is we're also, you know, there's things about, you know, using the Me Too movement and um, around other social issues. So I think that's, that's where the, the industry has stayed with, from its origins. 1913 is when the first feature film comes out. Within about four years, the, the authorities have picked up on the fact that this is quite dangerous. So the Cinematograph Act goes into place in 1920, although initial censorship has already begun. It's quite regional, it's quite local, it's handed over to the local administration, the, the imperial administrations and multiple districts of Bombay and Madras and so on. Um, but there's the cat and mouse game that then happens. 
between sort of 1920 and 1947 that um, filmmakers try and sneak in things or there's certain coding that the censors do not understand. Uh, sometimes when they're Indian censors, they, they, it's coded enough so they can look the other way. So there's a wonderful, wonderful moment of, you know, if you look through lots of films. Um, one of the ones I was talking about was a song, um, which is, which, you know, in the 60s we learned in school as a, as a kind of nationalist song, you know, and it basically the line goes, it's like, um, Get, go, go away world, Hindustan is ours. And it doesn't explicitly, you know, comes out in 19, early 1940s, explicitly anti-colonial, explicitly anti-British. Um, but somewhere down the, the many stanzas, it does this wonderful thing where it, never, first of all, never mentions the British, never mentions England, never mentions any of the codes, but it has one additional line that says, um, it, we oppose everyone whether they be German or Japanese, which is a nice way of kind of flying past the censors because of course we're not talking about the British, we're talking about those bunch, um, and this is the war on. Um, that kind of similar tropes, um, or similar techniques, I suppose I should say, have continued um, because the censor board still exists. Um, there's a constant um, back and forth and, and debate and discussion about it. Uh, there are obvious political agendas. Um, and in terms of stopping movies, banning movies, and so on. So, and, and the same, in similar kinds of techniques get deployed even now.